get right into the message today. I have, I'm going to tell you I've struggled with this message. And I don't like it when I struggle with the messages. But I know God's got a plan when I struggle with messages. And it's going to hit home and it's going to be what we need. So I'm going to jump right off in it. I would title this message. Uh, uh, I didn't know what to title it. So I don't, they don't even have a title for this message. That's how I've been struggling with this message. But this message, I'd title it, We Are in a War. We are in a war. How many of you have ever been in a fight and, and look like you, some of you raising your hand too quick? <clears throat> Hey, I, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a spat with the wife or the husband or the kids. I'm talking about an, I'm talking about an all out. Your life depends on that kind of thing. You're struggling. Maybe it's been a physical battle. Maybe it's a sickness or something. But you've been in a war and you had to fight to live. You had to fight to win. And so I want to talk to us this morning about a war that we're in. And we are in a war in America. We are in a war in, in Lake Village, Arkansas. We are in a war in Chico County. We're in a war in Arkansas. We're in a war in this country. We're in a war in this world. We are in a battle that cannot be won in the physical. We are in a battle. We're in a battle for this as President Biden said in September 1, 2022, he said, we are in a battle for the soul of this nation. He really didn't know what he was saying, but it was absolutely true. We are in a battle for the soul of this nation. We are in a battle for the soul of our children. We are in a battle for the soul of our families. We are in the, we are in the battle for the soul of our marriages. We are in a battle, church. Because the enemy is wide open. The enemy is trying to defeat us on every turn. And it started. Look, he's not worried so much about the world. He's already got them. He is, we are in a war in the church, from the church inside out. He's trying to destroy the church, the very standard, the very principles that this Bible is built on. Because if he can destroy the church, he's got the rest of the world. That's why in 2020, he tried to shut down the churches. It wasn't because of a pandemic. It was orchestrated from the pits of hell that there was a war going on. And this was a battle we fought. And thank God we had enough churches that said, I won't be closed. We went along with what, what the law of the land seemed to suggest at the time. But we realized we were in a, a battle for the soul of our nation. We stood up for what was right. We're still in a battle. We're still in a battle. Don't think that, 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 that thing's over. Don't think that's over for a minute. I'm here to tell you we are still in a battle. But we're in a battle right now for our children. And I'm going to try to keep this PG-13 today. I know we have our babies in here, but we're in a battle right now for the soul of our babies. There was a camp that went on this week, Camp Lilac. It was a, for a four year old through sixth grade, and they were having drag queen story hour. I'm telling you, we are in a battle for the soul of our children today. The LGBTQ plus movement is rampant. We are in a battle for the soul of our young people. And it's time the church recognized we're in a battle and to put on some armor and stand up and fight for the very thing God has given us. Not let the enemy Steal them. We are in a battle. We're in a war today. Drugs and alcohol are destroying our young people. They're destroying our families. They're destroying our adults. They're destroying marriages. Drugs and alcohol. I see it splitting them right down the middle, saying a little won't hurt. Everybody else is doing it. Just because everybody's doing it does not make it right. The Bible says that there's only going to be a few that enter into heaven by the narrow gate, but there'll be a wide gate that many go therein. So I'm here to tell you, if everybody's doing it, you might want to go the other direction. Because we're in a battle. We're in a war. You know, the old saying says, if everybody's running one way and someone's running the other, everybody says, well, look at that weirdo. Look at that idiot. He's, he's off of his rocker. He's done lost it. But you can't see everybody falling off the cliff. I'm telling you we're in a war today. 
We're in a battle today, Rusty. We're in a battle today for the soul of our nation and the soul of our nation is godly people because this country was founded on godly principles and when you take away the soul, the godly principles, things fail. Our democratic republic was built on morality. There has to be a certain amount of morality in people for our democratic republic to work. And where does that morality come from? It comes from God Almighty. It comes from people attending church. It comes from people being taught the truth and the word of God to live by the word of God to say this is truth and this is our standard of living. So I want to talk to you about this war. Edmund Berkman said this, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. The only thing for for evil to triumph in a church is for people to quit praying. The only thing for the enemy to get a a stronghold in the church is for people to quit attending church and, and, and stop praying. We are in a battle for the soul of this nation. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, the Bible tells us that it is not a flesh and blood. If we could quit looking across the aisle, across the aisle in the church at our brother and our sister and seeing what they're doing wrong and they ought to do this and they ought to do that and realize that it is not even in the flesh that we're wrestling. The Bible says that it is not in the, in the flesh. It says this in, in 12, verse 12. We do not wrestle for we do not wrestle. We need to get that in our spirit. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What are we wrestling against? And the Bible goes on to tell us but against principalities and against powers and against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We are in a battle, but it is not flesh and blood. It is a battle in the spirit realm, and you can only fight a spiritual battle in the spiritual realm, and that is through prayer. And we must pray that God would bring down strongholds, and then we do our part and be available for God to move in our lives. It's when good men do nothing when we sit back and say, well, God's going to handle it. God's all complete sovereign. He is sovereign, but he doesn't always move sovereignly. He uses people to accomplish what he wants. We read it in the Old Testament time and time again. Moses prayed God was going to kill the children of Israel. And Moses said, well, if you're going to do that, kill me too. And God changed his mind. God has relented on things he said he would do because people stood and people gathered together and people said, pray to God and God got God's attention. It is time that the church realized we're in a battle. And it is not against our neighbor over here. It is not against the deacon. It is not against the pastor. It is not against the children's pastor. It is not against the worship leader. It is against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're battling against. And we better realize, church, that we're in a war. That we're in a war. And the devil is relentless. The scripture goes on to say in verse 13, says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. I'm telling you, when you're in a battle, it's an evil day. And you gotta be able to stand. You better have on your armor because just because you handle the the title of a pastor or a deacon or associate pastor or whatever it is, worship leader, prayer, prayer leader, it doesn't matter your title. If you're not submersed in the word of God, if you don't have the whole armor of God on, I'm here to to tell you that the enemy is after you. He's going to attack you. He's going to take you out because all he wants to do is take out a few leaders and then the rest of the flock that are just playing church, they flee and say, I knew there was nothing to that God thing. That's the way the enemy works. I'm going to speak some truth to you today. Verse 14 says this, and I'm just going to read part of that. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. The verse goes on, but I'm going to stop there. With truth. And I'm going to speak some truth to you today. I believe the Lord's laid some things on my heart. That's truth. That we back up in the word of God. I'm not getting political. I won't be political. 
I'm going to tell you the word of God. I won't get off into what you believe socially. I'm telling you the word of God. You can be mad when you leave. I hope you're not. But if you leave mad, you're not mad at me. I just told you that it's a, it's a war. We're fighting principalities and we're fighting powers in, in heavenly places. It is not your pastor. It is not the deacon board. It is not your neighbor sitting in front or behind you. It is the enemy at war working within the church to divide and to conquer. Cut off the spiritual source. You know, I've done a little study one time on, on, uh, in, in, in our, on armies and, and, and uh, military forces. And the thing that would, they tried to do, especially in World War II, they tried to cut off the supply lines. If you can cut off the supply lines and you got a little tenacity, you can wait out your enemy when you cut off the food and when you cut off the artillery and when you cut off the support. Guess what? Just a little bit of time and you're going to win if you'll just stay the course. And that's what happens in these type of messages when the pastor preaches truth. The enemy comes in and wants to cut off that supply line called truth. Wants to cut off that supply line, the word of God, and get you, get you tuned out before the message is ever over. And you leave here already divided. And it ain't very long the enemy still tapping on you. Boy, aren't you upset over that? Boy, did he, did he say that? That was right to you. And for, before long, you cut off your supply line. You quit coming to church and you quit praying. You said, oh, I got hurt in church. Well, I hate you got hurt in church. I get hurt every week. Get over it. Put your big boy drawers on. Let's move on. You're in a war. We're not shooting BB guns. Man, we're shooting. We're, this thing's powerful. We're talking about the soul of your children, the soul of your family, the very uni, unified body that keeps America together. It's time to get over all this penny ante stuff and move on. I've listed some things. I started this last night and I put that up and I said, well, that's not God. Put my iPad, I was in my bedroom, put my iPad up, went in there and put it in the other room. That's where it stays. I don't keep it by my bed nor my phones. Put it in the other room, plugged it up, said, let me just sleep on this one because this can't be God. It was God. I just didn't want to preach it. And after a little while of struggling, I went up and got my iPad and come back and started writing these things down. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Remember that. In the church, in this church, I don't know, have you heard the news here lately how so many churches are embracing and ordaining homosexual pastors. I watched just the other day a big church, I believe it was in Atlanta, where they had the drag queen come up in a church, a mainline denomination in a church, and the pastor stood up in the front, just bragged on this Bravery of this drag queen as several of the little children sat around at its feet. Something like you would see a story in the Bible where the children would sit around Jesus' feet. That's what it reminded me of. It was a sickening feeling. It was a war. It was a battle. It is a battle. It is a demonic spirit within the church. And I saw that and I said, my God, what is going on in these pastors Minds. Now hear me out. We are not in a battle with flesh and blood. We do not hate or discriminate against any LGBTQ or any other things I'm fixing to talk about. We love the person, we hate the sin. Did you hear me? We love the person and we hate the sin. If we can't learn to hate sin, how can we grow close to God? Because if you're in love with the sin, sin separates us from God. You've either got to hate the sin and love God or love the sin and hate God. One of the two. (laughs) 
here at this church. We do not support critical race theory. There is no race in heaven. We are all the same people. We are black and white and red and yellow and brown. We're all precious in God's sight. There is no race. We won't let it happen here. We won't tolerate it in this house. Hear me out when I tell you this. Hear my heart. I know I'm a little explosive this morning, but I'm not mad at you. I'm mad. I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad at the devil that has come and has got this infiltrated in our, in our society where we got to be careful about this. And, and this is how we describe certain people. Baloney. God loves us all the same. Doesn't matter your title or your skin color or your ethnicity or where you're from. Your social economic background does not matter to God. Wish we could get that. Some people think because we got so much money, God loves us more. God doesn't even need money in heaven. He doesn't even use it there. God doesn't need your stuff. We do not support the Black Lives Matter movement. Hear me out. The movement. It's wrong. It's wrong. God loves all lives, all colors, all shapes, all sizes. God loves us. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says that while I was yet a sinner, the worst place you could be, not the color, not the social economic status, but while you were a sinner, the most vile place that a human being could be, the Bible says that God loved me then. He loves me then. He's not worried about the rest. Come on. We will not fly the pride flag at this church. We will not celebrate what God calls an abomination. We do not endorse same-sex unions. It is not a marriage. Hear me out. It is sin. It is sin. God called it sin. It's sin and it's sin. You can label it what you want to, but God said it's sin, and I got to go with what God says. It's sin. We do not endorse heterosexual cohabitation. It is not a civil union marriage. It is sin. It is rebellion against God. It is rebellion against what God instituted in Genesis. It is sin if it's not what God said. The intimacy between a man and a woman that are not married and it results in a baby being born is not a family. Hear me out. It is not a family. It's rebellion and a slap in the face of God. And God calls it fornication. God said it's wickedness. Nowhere can we cover it up and paint it up and make it okay with God. God's not going to look down because you go to church occasionally and wink at that and say, because you go and you're a good tither, I'm going to wink at that. No, it's wrong. You need to repent. Get right with God. Make yourself right with God. That's the only thing that's going to win this war is when the church gets right with themselves, gets right with God and says, I've got a purpose and a plan. God's put me here for this season, for this time, for this reason, and I've got to get myself right with God. You're never going to get right on your, uh, on your own. If you could do that, we wouldn't need God. I wouldn't be preaching to you from this word today. Hallelujah. We will not promote or affirm the transgender ideology. We believe God made you right the first go around. You don't have to come back and fix something God's already ordained from the beginning of time. The Bible says that he knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. I don't have to fix what God didn't mess up. Come on, somebody. You ought to give him praise in this house because I'm speaking some truth to you today. Speaking truth to you today. We will not buy into the demonic ideal 
of men in women's restrooms and women in men's restrooms. If you come in here a biological male, you'll go to the biological male restroom. If you come in here a biological woman, you'll go to the biological woman's restroom. I can assure you we have people that'll watch that and we'll make it happen because the moment we allow that to happen, the moment that happens, we go against God and God will leave this place. We will not tolerate this transgender ideology. We will not become like Chick-fil-A and be diversity, equity, and inclusive. D-E-I. How many of you heard that phrase lately? Well, let me explain it to you. Diversity refers to a people's race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, social economic status, language, disability or abilities, age, religious, commitment or political perspective. That sounds good on the surface. There's just one problem I have with that, that if you're committed to any other religion other than the Lord Jesus Christ, anything other than this Bible, you're committed to a wrong religion. It is a false religion and false religions do nobody any good. False religions will get you to hell. Have a problem with being diverse in that. We serve one God, the God, the only living God, the one and true God. There is no God besides Jehovah. He is God. The equity says that equity ensures everyone can achieve the same outcome regardless of their privileges and power differences. Well, that sounds good on the outside, but let me dig a little deeper. Equity does just because we give you something doesn't mean that you have the ability to rise to the, to the position of someone else. And that's what this says. No matter, no matter who you are, no matter your education, Jeremy, Jeremy what we're going to do, we're going to take someone right out of high school and we're going to say, in the name of equity, we're going to take you out of your position with years of experience doing what you do and we're going to put somebody in your spot because we want to be, we want to have equity inclusion in our company. How long do you think it's going to take for that company to go downhill when you move a man that's had years of experience and you put someone in there that does not have the training, may not even have the mental capacity to do what he does, or maybe not even have the emotional capacity to stand up and do what's needed to be done in a company? Now I'm going to explain God's diversity, equity, and inclusion in just a minute. Inclusion ensures people of all diverse backgrounds are welcome and have a seat at the table. Praise God, I believe that statement fully to that point, but there's a period right there. I believe that, that all God's people, God made everyone, God made every person. He didn't make homosexuals, they chose that. He didn't make drug, drug uh, abusers, they chose that. He didn't make alcoholics, they chose that. He didn't make prostitutes, they chose that, okay? You understand me? They chose that lifestyle. God made them and he loved them. And I believe that they can all come to the table, come to the feet of Jesus at the cross. I believe all are welcome. But you can't come in with all of your stuff with these ideas I've mentioned and say I'm going to infiltrate, the, infiltrate, uh, infiltrate this church. That's what's happening across America. It's not going to happen here. It's not going to happen. We're going to stand in prayer. We're going to be unified as one army. And we're going to be praying that when God, when it comes in, there's spiritual gifts. And the Bible says that there's discerning of spirits. That means when that evil spirit comes in, we as Christians ought to be able to recognize it, ought to be able to pinpoint it, ought to be able to go into prayer and point, it in, point our spiritual finger in its face and say, now devil, you can come, but you finna get saved or get out. Come on, somebody. Inclusion, I'll read the first sentence, ensures people of all diverse backgrounds are welcome and have a seat at the table. I'll say a place at the cross. This involves giving all employees the power to weigh in on important decisions and participate in development opportunities. That sounds like wonderful ideas. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. You got somebody that comes and don't care about being at the job site? 
just shows up for a check. They're a negative employee. They don't want to be there. They're unproductive. And you telling me that you want to include them on the decisions of where your company's going? That'd be like me saying, I'm going to take all the people here that come once a month and say, now we're going to get with you and you're going to give us the direction of the church. You've lost your holy mind. If it, what, listen, I'm not trying to be funny, but, but this is real. If you only think of God in the church once a month to come, do you think I'm going to hand over the decision making of spiritualness and where these people are going to be led to you? It won't happen. It will not happen. It may happen, but I won't be in this position. Here at the church, we will have, we will not have secular diversity, equity, and inclusion classes. However, God loves all people, diversity. He purchased us with his precious blood, equity. You've been bought with a price. Come on, somebody. And if you surrender your life to Christ, you are included in eternal glory with him in heaven. You can be included if you accept him as your savior. That's our DEI promise at this church. Glory to God. Give him praise in this house. Hallelujah. God didn't call us to be a diverse people. He called us to be a peculiar people. He said, come ye out from among them and be holy for I am holy. That is not inclusive. You can be included if you do what he says. Come ye out and be holy. If you're a peculiar people, you can't run with the devil on Saturday night and expect God to show up in your life on Sunday. You got to repent. Say, Lord, I've wronged. I've sinned against you. And I need to be made right. And the moment you don't do that, the moment you think, watch this, this is the enemy's trick. The moment that happens and you come to church and say, well, nobody knows, the enemy just won a battle in your life. This church will not, will not look down on you for a mistake. Because the moment this church looks down on you a mistake, we're going to get mirrors put all around this room and on the ceiling so that when you open your eyes, you see you. Come on, somebody. Pastor, you're doing good. You hadn't said any, hadn't had but one, one scripture verses. Well, praise the Lord. Watch this. I got some more. In Isaiah chapter 63, I was reading earlier this week, and I began to read in Isaiah, and and if you look at 62, 63, 64, all all right in there, you're going to find where the children of Israel, they, they rebelled against God. And when they rebelled against God, God said, okay, and he backs up a little bit, says you can do what you want to do. And in chapter 63, we pick up in verse 15. <clears throat> I think it's verse 50. I said, verse 15. We pick up the story where the people had come to their senses and realized that God was not around them. God was not, he was not uh, listening to them anymore. He was, he was just saying, do what you want to do. Have your way. Do it ever how you want to. But in 63 verse 15, the children of Israel, they had repented. And then they began to call on God. And this was right out of the gate. It says, look down from heaven and see from your habitation, holy and glorious. Where are your zeal and your strength, the yearning of your heart and your mercies toward me? Are they restrained? You want to know why the, we have powerless churches? It's because the churches have turned from God and they said, I'll do it my way. I'll put on a light and smoke show. I'll, have the, I'll hire the best and the biggest performers to perform on stage and I'll leave God out of it and I'll pack buildings and I'll fill them full and people will go home happy and we'll all smile and we'll feel like hell when we walk out the back door and our marriages are falling apart and our children are falling apart and our jobs are falling apart and our 
emotions and we turn to the bottle and we turn to drugs, if we would turn to Jesus, the drug problem would leave in America. Because they're searching for something, church. They're searching for love, affirmation. They're searching for peace and hope. And it cannot be found in material things. This thing is not a a battle on the flesh. It's a battle of spiritual warfare. The church needs to recognize that. Verse 16, it says, Doubtless. You are our father. I mean, they had come to a point that says, doubtless, there's no doubt you are our father. Says, though Abraham was ignorant of us. In other words, this has been some time down there. Abraham don't know them. They know of Abraham because of stories, but Abraham doesn't know their name. But it says, I like, but doubtless you are our father. Says, and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from everlasting is your name. O Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and hardened our heart from from your fear? Now, I want you to understand, you got to dig a little deeper. He didn't make them do it. It was a choice. You got to read the other verses, the other chapters. It was a choice. They're blaming. See, it's almost like, God, it's your fault. How many of you know people like that? It's it's God's fault. I'm in this spot because God put me here. God's got a plan. Well, God may have had a plan that you'd never be there. But because of our bad choices and our ignorance sometimes of the word of God, we make choices and God spares us and he gives us mercy. And he says, in the middle of your stupidity and your ignorance and your rebellion, I will use this for my glory. Return for your servant's sake. The tribes of your inheritance. Your holy people have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries have trodden down your sanctuary. We have become like those of old over whom you never ruled. Those who were never called by your name. The temple had been destroyed and they're calling on God. They realized that they had went so far down this road that the only thing that could save them, the only thing that could help them would be God to show back up, that God would, would look down upon them, that God would say, I am still your God. I'm still your redeemer. I'm still your savior. If you turn to me, I can turn this thing around. And in Isaiah 64, the next chapter, it's amazing how when we get ourselves in a pickle, how often we call on God, how often we lament to God, how often that we want to come and weep and beg God at the, at, the, at the altar for God to come and God to move in our lives in this same group of people. Basically, it's almost the same word for word that we read in Isaiah 63, 15 that it is in 64, verse 1. It says, oh, that you would rend the heavens that you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence as the fire burns brushwood to make your name known to your adversaries. See, it is not against flesh and blood. God fights in spiritual realms and the people of Israel, these chosen people said, God, if you would come down and you would show your name to your adversaries, his adversary is not the people. His adversary is spiritual wickedness in high places. And sometimes that infiltrates down to people because they rebel against God. And when we rebel against God, we become God's enemies. Oh, Church, we don't want to be God's enemies. That's why I stated these things in the beginning. I don't want to be God's enemy. I don't want to do things that would put me in on the opposite playing field of God because God's going to win every time. God, you may think you're winning. You may think I'm doing good in life, but I'm here to tell you, when God becomes your adversary, you will ultimately lose. Don't become an adversary of God. I don't want this church to be an adversary of God. It says that, that, that the nations may tremble at your presence. I'm here to tell you today, church, as I close, can we have a little music or something back there? 
I'm here to tell you today, church, we're not going to be opposite of God. If God's on that side of the battlefield, it is my job to take you to that side of the battlefield. Sometimes truth, let me back up and say this. Truth will always set you free. Let me say it that way. Truth will, will rub you the wrong way. Watch this. When you're trying to find the truth in what through the pastor, you find the truth in the word of God. Does the pastor say the truth? Speak the truth. If the truth is spoken from the word of God, based on the word of God, then know your adversary, know your enemy. It's trickery. It's trickery. The enemy wants you to get to split and divided. But the truth will set you free. The truth will expose all things. The problem is with truth, Here's the problem in the church with truth. Is we've all got sins that we're trying to cover up. And we pray if we get too close to the truth, we'll have to expose those sins. And then that's embarrassing. So what do we do? We stand back from truth. And we say, man, they need truth. Man, she needs truth. Boy, that person over there needs truth. As we stand in the shadows, I'm here to tell you today that until the church repents, just like the children of Israel and say, God, where are you at? We know that we have sinned. We know that we've done wrong in your sight. We know that it is us. It is not you, God. We know that we're saying, God, where is your presence? But it's more of a plea. God, where is your presence? We need your presence. God, where have you gone? We need you to be with us today, God. They understood That God wasn't turning his face from them. They understood that they needed to repent of their wrong. And when we repent as a church of our sins individually. Don't come, don't repent for my sins. That don't help you and won't fix me. Repent of your sins. Repent of your wrong. Say, God, I've wronged you. It doesn't matter what you think is right and wrong or what other people think is right and wrong for you wronging God. What do you know? What do you know? What does pastor know that is wrong in the sight of God? Lord, I repent. Some of you know this story, and I close with this simple short story because it's a real story. It really happened. And it goes along with my closing. I'm sorry for drinking so much water, but if I didn't do it, my throat would be gone. And some of you saying, well, I wish you'd hurry up and leave. Some of you heard this story here a while back. I was praying for my wife about some things in her life that I knew God needed to fix because I'm the pastor. pastor in my house too God needed to fix some things in her life that I just knew God was going to be so proud of me for bringing to his attention because you know sometimes he forgets especially in marital situations and I began to pray for her early one morning and I remember I felt real spiritual I put my hand on her back glory to God felt the Holy Ghost and I began to pray and I began to go through the list boom 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 And the Holy Spirit, it's almost as if he jumped up on my chest and said, Hey, when are we going to get around to your list? God, we're working on her list right now. Come on, that's the way we do. I'm making a point. I'm telling you something that happened in my life because no one, no pastor, no deacon, no teacher, no worship leader, no leader in this church is, is above the attack of the enemy, is above being a, a manipulated by the enemy. So I'm telling you, so I'm human. We're all in this together. 
And I began to pray for the things in my life that the Holy Spirit began to tell me about me. Two or three weeks later, you know what I realized? That her list had gotten a lot smaller because the things that I thought she needed to change in her life wasn't nothing. It was my daddy. You say, I don't mount a hill of beans. I tell you that story for you to do this today. Don't pray about someone else's issues. Don't repent for someone else. Don't call out their stuff. Why don't you work on you? Mike, you work on you. You leave Miss Stacy alone. Amen. Wesley, don't worry about your wife. Don't worry about Miss Jessie. You work on you. Come on, somebody. That's the way this thing's got to work. It's a one-on-one thing. This is not a this this right now. Look what we're fixing. It's not a team effort. This is one-on-one. You you you're all you're in or you're out. You're either in or you out. You either on the court or you ain't on the court. It's just, it's just you. You're the only one there. You stand before God, it's just you. It's just you and your openness and your sin and your, and your filthiness and your rags and your defeats and your brokenness. It is just you and God. Until you get to the point where you're broken and you have a contrite heart. You're just spitting in the wind. Let's get right with God. Let's get right with God. And you watch some of the problems that you have with other people go away. You watch some of the problems that you face with at work go away. Because the love of Christ will overflow you in a way and sustain you and help you and redeem you like never before. Will you stand across this building?